Um, thank you. Uh, a lot of information has been given this morning with respect to the epidemiology and the genesis of the viruses. I, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit on the vector control strategies that have been developed over the years. And the vector control strategies have been conducted over the Caribbean region for over 25 to 30 years. And particularly in Trinidad, you have focal, perifocal applications, which involves the actual placement of insecticides into potable water and con containers holding potable water, like in drums and other containers and water tanks. There's also the space spraying or ULV spraying, which was shown by one of the earlier speakers. Residual spraying, which is actually placing insecticides on walls, and we'll discuss that later on. And there's always been a health education and a source reduction program as the main pillars. Well, the question here is if they've been doing this for the past 30, 40 years, why is it that we are still having dengue epidemics? Are these strategies effective? Well, to summarize why they, these um, actually strategies have not been very successful is because we've been applica applications have been um, done because we think that one strategy would fit all that we apply one strategy in Jamaica in, in the, in the Mount, um, Blue Mountain region and we come to Trinidad and we go to Nyaro and we apply the same strategy and it does not work like that. There are unique um, variability and unique differences in the ecology of, uh, of the various countries. And therefore, we have this problem of failure of the application methodologies. Um, a lot of um, countries have developed the strategy, if you ignore something long enough, it goes away. And in some cases, very early on, when there was one serotype circulating, when all the non-immunes were um, used up by the, um, by the virus, uh, then the disease actually declined. And everybody said, oh, it went away. We did well. Um, the, some countries go on the, on the negative and say, oh, there is no dengue epidemic, when in fact there are overwhelming evidence that there is. Uh, and then we have the delusion that outbreaks um, go away, you know, and because of vector control. Well, we are now in a situation where we can't see that anymore because we are having dengue at frequencies of every five years. And my research um, to date is showing that the actual frequency is going to every two years. So, so there is therefore a lack of political will or support for programs and therefore if that is not developed very quickly uh, and we embrace the politicians and the politicians embrace the vector control programs, it's going to continue to fail. So again, so using the same approach and not expecting resistance is a, is, is a recipe for disaster. And one of the reasons why the topic is lessons not learned is because many of us don't read. The literature, and we have Dr. Paulson, whose whole PhD thesis is on resistance, insecticide resistance in the Caribbean, and it's ADC Japan resistance to the various insecticides that are used. Yet, much of that work has not been translated into practice. So we have also had a resistance to adopting new strategies. We have had a decline in community support. Why would communities support us if you continuously bombard them and they are seeing no apparent change? So we have some other people who are the, the uh, people who have um, wares to sell. They advocate strategies and they say it's going to work and some people actually believe it. And we also have the non-technical advisors. And that's part of the pr problem. 
And, and this is one example of how you can have some inappropriate um, 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 applications where people were actually talking about using aerial spraying. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you apply aerial spraying when the trucks and the forks, which are right at the ground level, are not working? How can you expect it to come from the sky? and actually effect control. So there's really a lack of penetration of the insecticides into households to kill the resting mosquitoes. There's an increased risk if you do this aerial application for asthmatics and people with um, in, um, respiratory illnesses to actually have attacks and illness. There's a negative impact of the insecticides on pollinators, our environment, our, our pristine, the, the birds, the bees that provide our honey. And there's also the negative effect on aquaria fish and our fish in, in, in the environment. The destruction of components of the ecosystem which keeps us alive. Uh, and these are the kinds of consequences that are not taken into consideration when certain strategies are advocated. There are compelling reasons, but I, I say it is almost like um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Should we do aerial applications, we'll have no bullets singing in the morning. So, there, so we have a problem. And uh, the best person who have put this together is Clint Eastwood. He said, a man got to know his limitations. <laughs> and, if you do not know your limitations, you will continue to make the mistake. And one of the limitations that we have found in our research over the years is that anti-sedeptine mosquitoes, and by extension, the dengue virus, do not cross over um, road um, highways. Because so that you are genetically isolated from either side. So why can't we use this as part of our control strategy. So why don't we use highways as the barriers? In epidemiology, we all talk about barrier effects and all that. But let's translate our knowledge of barriers and develop strategies based on good, sound epidemiological approaches. So our research showed that in highways, there were no dengue cases or dengue hemorrhagic cases along those roads. The second class roads, there were only 7%. But the massive amount of cases occurred around the third and fourth class roads. So immediately we are seeing, we are seeing that dengue and the mosquitoes are actually occurring at communities where the road, the kind of class of roads are different from the traditional highways. So immediately we could start partitioning where we apply certain strategies. There is also the, the strategies called Casa Segura, which is, um, which is a safe house. This study was done in Mexico, which identified 27 days after a dengue case was found that there was a positive mosquito for dengue virus in the bedroom of the patient. So the mosquito had not moved from that house after 27 days. Our work as well on containers, and we have done some work on cardinal points, also suggests that the mosquitoes do not move very far. So you have a dengue case, your management strategy could be very, very simple. It used the house to the east, to the west, to the north, and to the south. And there is where you will find the dengue eating mosquitoes. And that's where you do your application. Rather than in the traditionals, where, where you do total areas or in blocks, here you have an opportunity to actually fine tune it. And this new, new micro investigation method, um, um, Professor uh, Dr. Doon was here, and he was part of this. Um, study in 2007. The other study that I'd like to, and I told you that we were going to talk about, 
First, where do the mosquitoes, most of the mosquitoes are found? They're found in the bedrooms. And that's the reason why if you aerially spray, it's not going to penetrate. If you spray outdoors, it's not going to penetrate if the householders do not open the doors and windows to allow the fog to get in. Because the majority, over 90% of the mosquitoes are found in the bedroom and the living room. Not in, and and that, that's what the facts are. So you need to start targeting exactly where the mosquitoes And therein lies why DDT, which um, Dr. Gandhi said, spoke this morning, said why it was so effective. It's because DDT was applied to the walls. And that's the reason why we eliminated malaria and lymphatic filariasis, because these mosquitoes rest on walls. ADT Japan is no different. And that's the reason why we had lots of success during the malaria campaign um, with the ADS program. So if we go back to the future, we go back and do the basics, we will actually have success. And therefore, to return to residual spraying, but dyno fogging inside houses, so you actually get the penetration of the fog in the house where the mosquitoes are resting. The alternative is to actually return to residual spraying. And this is based on evidence. You can also introduce curtains which are impregnated with insecticide because the mosquitoes must enter the house, the rooms, and exit the rooms. And therefore, this is an opportunity for the manufacturers of curtains to actually impregnate them with suitable insecticide and actually have a reduction in the population. So we need to have new, new ideas, new approaches based on research, development, and lessons from previous work. So what are these new ideas? Well, we need, therefore, to start thinking about the mosquito. If we do not know the animal that we are trying to control, how are we going to really do it? And for so long, for 30 years, we have really not understood the mosquito that we were trying to control. And now I think we have reached the point where we have the bionomics kind of worked out. Not fully worked out, but kind of. So we know blood feeding times. We know resting sites before and after blood feeding. We know OV position time, time you lay eggs. We know the time when the rest, the resting sites. We know sugar feeding times. We know the resting sites pre and post sugar feeding. We know the rest indoors in bedrooms, on clothes, and other wall, on walls. We know the resting place outdoors at dark areas under houses, resting places under leaves of grasses, and resting places in dark places close to oviposition sites. So this is all that we know. We also know from the physiology that these mosquitoes need to rest on walls. The, and the adults, the first of Bowden, since 1991, said that mosquitoes after emergence need to rest for 24, 24 hours after emergence. post insemination after the females are actually inseminated, they need to rest 12 hours. And all of this buys time. And essentially what we, I'm trying to demonstrate here is that the mosquitoes are going to rest on walls. They're going to find resting places. And if that is the weak link, that's the point that we need to um, elaborate. And in, in a case like where there's an outbreak of dengue and chikungunya, you need to start looking at the behavior. This is the circadian rhythm, which encapsulates all those information that was provided um, just a few minutes ago. So, the missing links, human and community <coughs> acceptance. So how well are we at getting the communities to buy into our programs. And, and to me, that is one of the major missing links. What are the levels of knowledge, attitudes, practice, and beliefs of the community? Will they accept um, alternative strategies? 
who are the community leaders? What are the demographic studies done? What housing patterns, all of that? The need to conduct a social science study on the target communities. Now, people would say, we've done that. Yes, we've done that. But it was done in 1991 to 1993. We are in 2014. A generation has come up. Is it that this still holds Rosenbaum et al.? Is it that data still valid? Who knows? We don't know. But even at that time, the, the populations were telling us in the region that only 10% of them were concerned about Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Far more of them were concerned about rats, night biting mosquitoes, and an unreliable water supply. So the priorities in 1991 was different. And is it the same today? The need for research and the need to have these studies continuously done is important because if we do not understand the communities, like if we do not understand the mosquitoes, we are not going to have the success that we require. So what are some of the lessons learned? We need to know a little more about genetics. We need to know ecology. We need to know about the life cycle of the mosquitoes. We need to know about the anthropologic and anthropogenic factors of human population size, housing patterns, behavior, culture, socioeconomics. We also need to know about the environment and vector competence. So translating knowledge, therefore, into action and practice is the challenge and the opportunity available to us as a community. So our whole WHO prescription is the IBM strategies. The selection of methods based on knowledge of local vector biology, disease transmission patterns. The utilization of a range of interventions, often in combination and synergistically. Collaboration with the health sector. Engagement with local communities. The use of public health regulations, the law, the rational use of insecticides, and good management practice, and for, 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 what, uh, for want of a better term, the need for ongoing research. So my prescription this morning is really that there's no magic bullet. There must be an integration of chemical and sound management practice, or any kind of combinations or integration of chemical and biological integration of chemical sterile techniques or management, integration of trapping chemical and biological. So the use of sticky traps. Um, this has been discussed over the years that it removes mosquitoes and that's what a sticky trap looks like. That's what a double sticky trap. And you can see the mosquitoes on the inside. And this is just some results where you can see the adult traps were actually removing um, we're actually moving, removing about 4,000 adults in six weeks and over 16,000 immatures in six weeks. So there is a lot of, uh, there is a role for actually removing adults and immatures from the population. Of course, these techniques can be used for epidemiology and surveillance because the mosquitoes you collect can be used for ECR um, studies. There's also the pre-seasonal, uh, and uh, some people alluded to that this morning. And yes, we developed the pre-seasonal um, methodology of, uh, about four or five years ago, but how often has it been introduced? We know the rains are coming. Did anybody over the past month put down chemicals awaiting the onset of the rains? Yeah, this has been demonstrated since 2003 in a study that I did in Curap and St. Joseph and showed how clearly um, pre-seasonal treatment can be effective. And it actually reduced the, the population <coughs> densities quite significantly and it holds it for quite a while. But how many times do we keep going on and on and it's just not going? My, my work, I'm, I'm happy people talked about chikungunya. Over the past uh, five years, I've been working in the Indian Ocean Islands and currently I'm working in Southeast Asia developing a SIT, a sterile insect technique program, 
but for these countries. And one of the methodology, this methodology, is environmentally friendly. It does not contaminate natural food chains. It benefits wild and three animals. It focuses on the species specific uh, to be controlled and does not pose a threat to human health. And it's very effective against dengue and chick. Um, I could avoid for it because I work in Mauritius and Reunion and Madagascar and a few of the other islands during the, the chikungunya um, epidemic. So what are the lessons? The lessons to be learned from our studies show that um, we need to develop a sound develop, um, program of laboratory rearing. Males must be able to mate with wild females. Sex separation, we need to develop these laboratory methods. The release of methods and sites must be suitable for all weather. The production facilities must be available. We must be able to time of release of vital, which is vital to success. So these are the kinds of things that we need to put in place if alternative strategies are to be done. Um, this is just a, a, an outline of what it takes, and, and this is why everything that we do is evidence-based. So, you know, it's not actually people getting up in the morning and saying this is a good idea. So everything that we do, there is some science behind it. So, um, and, and this is just the, 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 the run of how you would actually go about doing the um, SIT program. Uh, and, and this is the final bit of it, where you need the adults to adapt to outdoor environments. The flight and foraging for um, release of males in the environment, in counter the Aedes aegypti, females, and we use the bionomics for the behavior. And then finding resting sites, we know where the resting sites are, encounter wild virgin females, courtship, successful population and induced refractiveness. And for people who want to know what SIT is, it's very similar, it's sterile insect technique, it's very similar to both control. So what are the guiding principles therefore? So, and this is coming more and more important, and the whole ethics of research. So I, I spelled guiding wrong, I think. Um, and I don't believe anybody because I typed it. It's right. It's right. It's Sorry. right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe, okay. So we need to have autonomy, which underlies the need for informed consent of the communities that they work in. There must be free and, and informed consent. Informed consent uh, comprises three major elements, information, volunteering, and um, comprehension of what is being done. There must be justice and inclusiveness, and of all things, all people should benefit. And my last slide is really what I'd like people to, to take home message, is integration, and, and I didn't know about um, TNT net and the carry net and all the other things when I prepared this slide, but I think this fits in very well with, this model fits in very well with the host the double host of this particular symposium, where there is, um, you take into consideration the weather conditions, the vector, the human data, which is part of the predictive thing, but you also have the community reporting, civic engagement, and you also have the health communications, which is, I guess, part of CARFA's remit, and that are all the other the targets that are in there. In, in, in this particular model. It's called the bus, must bus model, uh, which is quite interesting, and it will actually provide the feedback that is required. So as a Caribbean unit, maybe this kind of approach is required as we move on and start using the evidence that is available to actually inform policy and to actually change the way we actually do vector control. Um, I'm happy that, that they were talking about um, a dengue week. Uh, um, there is, uh, I was actually in discussion with a high-ranking person in Trinidad 
to actually declare a dengue day. But uh, I'm, I, I will be happy to work with you all on this because my idea was to actually have a day dedicated in Trinidad and Tobago, which is actually called dengue day. But if you wanted to spread it for a week, that's fine. <laughs> so uh, with that, I thank you all um, for your attention. And um, I'm sorry, I have to leave. Um, so I, I will, uh, because I have a flight to catch to the end. So thank you very much.